Hello everyone and welcome to episode 90 of Competitive Magic with the Carnies. I'm your host from Italy, Andrea Mengucci, and joining me as always we have Javier Dominguez from Spain. Hello everyone. And Anthony Lee from Australia. Hola. The Carnies are back and uh, we are ready to talk to you about some uh, Duskmorn spoilers. The set is gonna go out on MTG Arena and uh, Magical Line uh, just today, just right after this podcast uh, is being recorded. So um, I'm excited to do some drafto. What are you guys excited about? Do you plan on playing some uh, Magic Arena today? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, I mean, I love exploring the sets in, in Arena. We're going like the draft and it's also going to be the set we will play in Worlds. So definitely very excited. Same, same, same. I don't play Worlds, but I definitely will be excited about playing uh, arena. I have done the early access last um, Friday, done three drafts, and uh, I drafted black white uh, reanimator, which is super fun. And our reanimator strategy is we were talking about uh, uh, here, maybe, maybe playable in Pioneer too. The the cards are definitely there for uh, for reanimator. Uh, Javier, have you, have you checked this card, Valgavoth, Terror Eater? Well, I know what it does now, but I have not thought like in depth how good it will be it's definitely like the kind of card that's made to be cheating on play i guess like you know with creativity or whatever but like it's also like not that good if you're not in the battlefield so we'll see i don't think it's bad for yeah. the tracks for a pioneer but maybe it is it's hard to tell yeah if you plan to top nine lands it's probably not good but if your plan is to Cheating to play in some other ways, it may be better than attracts. I, we were talking about how creativity sometimes played attracts and lost, whereas this guy seems to be a little bit harder to kill, you know. Like, he doesn't get bounced by prison bar and attacked with some kind of phoenixes. So I think that could be one of the strengths that this card has uh, going for it. Well, phoenix specifically has the tools to actually bounce it and sacrifice, you know, like a phoenix, to phoenix and, and one bottle, <laughs> uh, one, like one um, prankster or whatever. So specifically against phoenix, I am not sure. <laughs> yeah, but, so but the, the these cards get exiled though. It's not it's not very good. Ah, okay. Then maybe yeah. maybe it's really so not. It's a little, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe it's to balance it, but yeah, I, it's a very expensive cost to sacrifice three null land for events and yeah, But you can exiled. also maybe use that power it. I don't know. Like if you attack and they have like some creature. Uh you know, I just I don't think it's just like good game by itself every time it's probably good enough but like if, yeah. if you attack and they have phoenixes and then temporal trespass you know let's say you're at 14 life you have to attack at some point right i don't know like or it's only like oh so it's hard to be it's, it's like nine like nine life like it seems very hard to even with trespass it's not easy yeah Especially no i'm also saying I'm, you know, yeah that's what i'm saying like you cannot fool future treasure cruises like i thought it was like um creatures gone to the battlefield die get excited oh, yeah. or whatever but it's all it's little of the void that yeah. okay well that's that's pretty good i i thought <laughs> i knew what a card did but obviously i didn't because the cards are new and i'm very bad at reading cards but wow but okay, this is good. Have you, you could you could have listened to our episode of last week where you weren't part of well but i, I would have showed you yeah what this card does i was full you know full <laughs> dying for the whole week <laughs> with my my throat uh, killing me, so I actually didn't do anything magic related or non magic related until the very last time in the week. The weekend I went to the pre release. I don't know if you guys did go. Yeah, I was. I wanted to ask you, did you go to the pre release? So you said yes, I hear that. How uh, how was it? Honestly, it was fun. Like I am not that much of a pre release person, uh, but I also you know I've lived in a small village with sheep and goats for long enough that uh, you know pre releases were not very common there. But this time now in Madrid, I decided to decide to go to one, and I actually had all the fun. Um, you know, things were smooth. Um, there were a few like very interesting games. I, I I liked the experience. I will probably run it like. I will probably go to more for less in the future. I honestly did like the the structure. I also don't like that much the small releases or whatever, but this one was like, you know, just a tournament, like six rounds plus topic draft or whatever. So it was, wow. uh, yeah, so it was good. You know, it was appealing for me. Like, I don't really like these three round releases or whatever. So yeah, I mean, I busted, but it was fun. So I will probably play more. What about you guys? Yeah, I'm jealous of your 
of your schedule of your type of tournament is mine was just you know a small pre-release four rounds um yeah i mean, I, did, I went it went well for me i opened uh four mythic rares on color so it was a very strong deck i didn't lose a game <laughs> and um yeah what can i say i won um, six boosters and i went home happy uh what about you anthony yeah i mean i played a couple of small pre-releases they were pretty good uh it was an interesting format and uh i don't know they're just they're kind of nice to play i agree with Javier that the small small pre-releases are less exciting mostly because it feels like a bunch of work building a sealed deck for not not that many uh, matches out of it but it's still it's still fun um and I, I i like the casual vibe of these events um yeah not too much to say about it really i had uh, a card that i was so so impressed with um i believe it's in english it's called under the skin what, what about, the Itali- the what about skin. The italian what's it mean italian sotto la pelle okay yeah, uh, so it's a three mana sorcery manifest dread, and then you may return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. So it was like a better eternal witness that uh, yeah, I was like you know, so impressed by this card. Ah, because you can actually mill the permanent and get it back. Yeah, yeah. I had to ask oh, about this, but yeah. So good. like, I needed a fo- I needed a fourth land, so I cast it on turn three and just mill the land. So I just put it in my hand, and like later in the game was eternal witness. And pretty good actually so powerful for a three mana sorcery wow i mean for a sorcery very flexible Sorry. Yeah, yeah definitely like mm-hmm. yeah it's true i mean we've seen you know worse cars c play in standard or whatever so <laughs> <laughs> certainly have but yeah no overall the the whole like locking the 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 um, unlocking the door was a cool thing like they were very they all give you a lot of options i felt like as always happens in limited it's very it's very hard to flood, especially with the, like the manifest dread. You just always have things to do with your lands, um, which is a good thing for uh, for limited, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, the the rooms were were actually fun. I thought they were interesting, and obviously they're new cards, so they're not uh, that easy to evaluate. But it's like, well, they keep having like these new type of cards, and I think it's cool. You know, they can have they keep having like these new designs that are like interesting to play with. I don't know. How do you, how do you feel about the rooms, Anthony? Um. Well, I I, did, I I thought they were. I don't know if I thought they would be better or stronger than they actually are, but I think I misevaluated them uh, to begin with uh, because I compared them to advent. I, I compared the room mechanic to adventures uh, early on because of the thing where you can pick a side and then get the other side later as well. So it has some similarities to Adventure there. I mean, obviously Adventure looked a little bit differently because um, one side precludes the other. But uh, they didn't really work out that way because they're specifically not creatures and that changes quite a lot about the mechanic. And I thought um, that going against expectation there was very interesting. Um, I, you know, I mean, also <laughs> horror sets of learning expectations, I guess that makes sense. But Magic often subverts your expectations in that way uh, in terms of how you think things are going to go uh and yeah i, I thought they were very interesting yeah uh they, and and they all play quite differently like it's not like the rooms are all similar to each other like some of them do work well as mana sinks and other ones are closer to modal cards and other ones are closer to fodder and yeah and, and they have like a variety of power levels like if they were all good or all bad that would be less interesting as well but i think it's a very well executed card type yeah Okay, there is a there is a card that we last 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 week we've talked about a bunch of pioneer cards, uh, but we failed to mention one that uh, Anthony felt strongly about. Leyline, I guess you resonated with this one. Yeah, Leyline of oh, Resonance. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm always proud whenever I get to do a joke in English. I think it's yeah. good. You should so. do it more often. People don't do it enough in it, English, honestly. People should imagine how fun Mango is in Italian. You know, for a second. How many jokes? How, how many jokes he can make in Italian every minute? Anthony? Is it a lot? All the jokes. Yeah. And I try. I try. I try to. Because it might not be about yeah. whether he can or whether he wants to, right? Like some people can and they don't. Uh, goodness knows why. So, like in Italian, we have also all, all like different dialects. Yeah. Which I think makes people even more fun. But anyway, full mana, but it's a ley line, so it doesn't matter if it's in your hand. You put it into play, and you feel lucky. <laughs> and your opponent feels unlucky, so that's already like 
a start of the game, you get a little bit of advantage. But anyway, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only a single creature you control, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. And obviously this card slots perfectly into the deck that we've talked to you about um, last, uh, last week's, which is the one with... Uh, uh, Valiant uh, Hero and Heartfire um, Hero. Heart Hero and the the the, um, the the new Mono Red Prowess, which has been one of the most popular deck, which plays uh, a ton of pump spell. You have Monstrous Rage. You have the Ancestral Anger. You have um, yeah, all sort of pump spells that uh, will now get copied, and you'll uh, you get free value for free. It's powerful. Yeah, I, I expect this card to be very impressive in Pioneer, where there's a lot of very strong spells you can copy with this. Um, like, this card is just worth, like, a lot of cards and mana that I think uh, it probably powers up that deck quite significantly, and that deck already does well, right? Like, there are other cards where you could see them going into a fringe archetype or maybe creating, like, one of those fringe archetypes, but it's not often you just see a card printed and you're like, oh, that just goes in one of the best decks and it's probably a big deal for that deck. That's usually a sign that you have to take that card very seriously. So I felt that it would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about uh, this ley line for Pioneer. I mean, it's a it's hard, hard card to evaluate, I think, also because it has some upsides where, like, if you cast two spells, this obviously like very good. Like, it's like a zero mana card advantage that gives you tempo, but also obviously opens vulnerabilities to the card thoughts. So it, it's like uh, maybe. You know, like, is there a world where these decks are actually better without the Leyline, do you think? Or yeah, that's well, very just possible. not going to happen. I think, mm -hmm. I think that won't actually be the case because of the way this generates cards, like, reasonably often. Like, for example, with Ashes for Anger, this is literally drawing cards. But uh, it does, in general, make you a little more susceptible, right? Like, it, like anything that makes your deck more synergy-based inherently makes you a little bit worse against interaction. But I think, in this case, the way the card specifically works probably outweighs that. But you know, it depends on what interaction people play, of course. Um, it, could, it could it could suddenly go the other way. Yeah, I'm thinking more of, like, just, you know, Thoughtseize, because Thoughtseize can either attack... Like, you need to have, like, creatures and synergy spells, right? So yeah. Thoughtseize actually attacks both, where, you know, a little push doesn't go work that well against this, because they can maybe wait or duress or whatever, but, like, Thoughtseize makes them, like... So they cannot really choose how to play ranked interaction because Tatsu doesn't care about you know type of cards. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying. Like, I mean, obviously the card reads powerful. I think this card is sort of designed to be powerful, but I also think this might end you know being like too cute, like too m like if your deck is doing the pioneer thing where you're just by casting like all this you know, pop spells or whatever, um, and killing them fast, maybe you don't need this as, as much. And if your hand is a bit weaker and you have this card, sure, you're going to, you know, get more flashy kills when you get there. But if you get thoughts is away, maybe it's just not as good. Uh, uh, you know, obviously it depends on the matchup. If you're playing against, like, Lotus Skill, this is probably great. But if you're playing against a deck, like, Sacrifice or whatever, I could see this being not great. I, I don't even know how good this will be against Phoenix. Because they still have a lot of... Um, I guess against Phoenix it's fine, because if you have two creatures, you still get the effect, I will say. But it's not that good, right? I mean, if you have two creatures on a ley line, and you play one spell, and respond to kill the creature, how advantageous is that, do you think? Uh, it's not great, I guess, but um, with... It depends. Like if, they're, if they also are playing a creature deck, you get some buyout as well, because one of the cantrip ones, like if you play... Cards like Ancestral Anger, you can target one of their creatures with one of the copy, or if you spread out two copies, um, you get to definitely draw an extra card at least. Um, it, it, there's also like some tricky spots where. Oh, okay, that's good. I I see what you mean. I didn't think of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's that's actually good. Yeah. Um. There's also some tricky spots as well where like it you like it's already like kind of hard to play against. Uh, this the combat tricks with damage based removal like fiery impulse, but this really punishes you. Like if you, like it makes it like you can if you this lets you like wait a lot, I think because you will catch up very quickly, and you miss damage later. So like if you attack, they can't really play their removal spell before damage because if you respond with a trick, they get completely crushed. 
and then the game just keeps going on, but you get more advantage for the number of spells you cast, right? So uh, you actually can play long games with this card as well, I think, especially when you get to play some of the ones that draw cards for advantage. So I think... Okay, that, that is yeah. true, but well, there's one thing that, well, if you're playing this card, you're also going to have Leland's top decks or bad top decks as well, so you're going to lose a bit of this advantage you're talking about. Yeah, definitely. I, although, honestly, I think maybe <laughs> against some decks you could probably, if you played against Blue Eye or something, I think you would honestly just end up casting this, but yeah, it's definitely a downside. We would need to find some way to mitigate that. Like, I think that you probably have to, like, you might have to deck build a little bit more differently with this card because of that, but I, th I think the power level is like really, really high for this for this card. Um, well, there's a card that uh, lets you discard it for some value. It's the fear of missing out. Uh, yeah, the two mana yeah. two three. Uh, I mean, and with delirium, uh, it can give double strike to. So to yeah, a creature. I thought maybe this would work because you could give double strike to something after you use a lot of tricks. But it's that the leyline is very hostile to having delirium, right? Because you want your deck to be mostly creatures and instants, and then. It's not very easy to actually end up with delirium, even if you could discard, uh, even if you could discard the ley line. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I I don't think that that it actually works out that way. But yeah, like, like you're not gonna yeah. play sorceries in that deck. Yeah. Like, virtually no sorcery is gonna be considered as playable in that deck. Well, you'll so play answers to length, but yeah. Um, well, but you know, overall, like you you need many. to be like it's gonna be like creature land instant and enchantment exactly. Yeah, it's tough. I, I, it's tough. I, I think you will need first missing out to be like great, and I don't think it's gonna be the case. Yeah, right. I think it's just too small. Um. Yeah, what do you guys think about Razornita ahead? The two minus two two for a strike on your turn, and that pings your opponent for one. You think it can see playing those mono red deck? No, I or think... do you think it's just for standard only? This card just seems bad. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I think this card is sort of. I mean, I don't know. That, like, I just filmed this card and I thought this card was designed for multiplayer play. <laughs> I don't know. That was my first there? impression. Like, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm saying it because it says uh, an opponent or whatever, but like, I don't think this card is very good compared to whatever to drop that's red you want to compare with. Like, is this even better than, I don't know, the 2 2 Fissure Strike haste creature from Sa Ravnica? That didn't yeah, I was going to say, I think this is probably worse than Valley Dash. Like I, I think this. Well, card is... I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's worse than Baladasha, but it's definitely worse than something like Urshaka, Shaken Kendra, or whatever. Definitely oh, yeah, worse sure. than the 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 chicken with prowess. Now we have, or sorry, the the slick slick shot. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this card is not on the power level. I think this will only be playable if Red had like virtually no playable true drop, and had like awesome one drops and you know the rest of the deck. I don't know. I don't think. I mean, I guess it's playable against specifically Phoenix, because I don't know if it is. Like, you know, I mean, it probably is playable, right? I, I already it. don't want to cast like There's multiple cantrips against a, a red deck. Like you have to interact with this, right? Usually, like if you, if like the hands where you spend early mana and stuff like consider are usually not good for you anyway. Like I, I really think that it just being a two two that doesn't attack immediately is. Like absolutely horrible against like I, I could imagine many many better two drops against Phoenix than this card. I think. Well, this one punishes them for playing Cruise. Like you can play this. I'm thinking more like you know the classic to turn four. You play this card when they're gonna Cruise, and it's actually annoying. Maybe. Mm. It's a bit of a long shot, but. <laughs> yeah, There's another maybe. red card. Yeah, go ahead. That uh, pioneer decks can consider, not necessarily uh, mono red because it doesn't do great there. The Overlord of Boiler Brilgus. So I was thinking about playing this card in uh, uh, Enigmatic Fires Incarnation because it's a four mana. It deals four damage to any target, which obviously is a creature, and then you can sacrifice this and go get like a Traxa or whatever seven drop you want to get because you can play there and just chills there. I think that if you have fires, you can't cast this, right? Yeah, that was gonna, that's probably the the big question because if you cannot, this is just a straight unplayable. I think. Yeah, you can. You can play this with fires. Yeah, pretty sure. Why wouldn't you? Be able is to? it still fires? One of your favorite fa most the favorite cards ever, Anthony. Uh, it's one of the cards of all time. That's for sure. And somebody <laughs> designed it. Uh, I mean, that's actually. Oh no! Wait, sorry. Since angle, you may like, cast like, mana, I mean, you have to have seven lands to do it. Sorry, six lands to, to cast it. Sorry. So um, otherwise, you cannot. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I, I kind of missed what you were actually asking. Like, I thought uh, I kind but, of took the question literally. But if you mean, can I cast it for four mana 
with four lands and fires, you can't do that. Sorry. I I just thought you were asking if you just casted it generally. <laughs> no, then I, th- I think GG. I think this card then is not good for Pioneer. Like, if you could cast it with fires, maybe, maybe it would be fine, right? Because you could cast this four mana and... Well, I mean, maybe, maybe it's not completely unplayable, but... Just don't play fires, right? Well, I mean, but you can... Pl- this, this, like, this Overlord making like so you have a lot of combinations to get a seven drop will probably make fires good enough like fires into this is actually mm, a good yeah. tempo swing for sure yeah because it's not that many enchantments interact the way this does at that cost um exactly like this ley line but you i mean the deck was already like a very like heavily ley line dependent right like whenever you go and go and could go like ley line into incarnation it will be like ho ho atraxa but this will give you more combinations and so there's a card that makes Leyland work a bit better, and it's Overlord of the Houndswood. And this is, again, the Overlord, but green. And it costs one less. It costs three. And it gives you a land token named everywhere that he's every color, every basic land type. So let's say you, know, you don't have all the money. You don't have all the basic colors. This one fixes you for that. And then, of course, you can go get a six drop with a Enigmatic Incarnation the next turn. So this could be, and then you have also one mana left over to do something else. And this this, this card is definitely like playable and power level for that deck. Uh, the issue here is more like, well, is this really like? Can you afford to play these kind of cards? Like, because you having, it's like you having to to put these over other three drops, for example, or just build your deck differently will have a significant cost. Like, I mean, this is obviously worse than Fable in that deck. I mean, at least that's what I what I will say. Uh, <laughs> yes, but I mean, you never know, right? But I, I think like you know, you will have to put some six drops in your deck, and that's that kind of stuff really adds up very fast in a deck like Incarnation, where a lot of your slots are like, actually locked. Yeah, yeah. The, the mana cost is also quite taxing in Incarnation. I think one green green is yeah, one green green you know. is is hard. Yeah, actually, and I actually I think... think that demon is is actually potentially playable in Pioneer. I, Which one? The the one you have the screen. Doomsday Excruciator, six uh, single black mana for a six six flyer. When it comes to play, what does it do? It exiles everyone's decks except the last bottom six. Yeah, I think. I mean, I th- why would you? Why would you think it's? I, th- I think this card is probably good against Phoenix, overall. And I just think like the devotion decks, like this card is that's a lot of devotion. Like if you have this creature in the battlefield, you're going to have like a bunch of devotion. And I think the Midhood Massacre. That that that's the deck I built for the Harry Wayne Finder. This set actually, and I think there might be something around there. I mean, the waste not decks are bad. <laughs> like they're bad, and but the, the the black shell that interacts is so good that the deck somehow holds well. That's my impression. Like I think waste not decks work very well, even though the waste not shell is like pretty much only good against Phoenix and Shredder or whatever, and the deck still like is sort of functional. And I think there might be different shells where you can have cards that actually punish other decks for the way they function. I don't exactly know. Like maybe you can build a devotion deck that's actually designed to cast Vagavoth, for example. Now that I know what it does, uh, because with Lena of the Void and some like, you know, if you have Lena of the Void and then you play like a four mana, three mana black card, you can actually nick this into Vagavoth, right? And if you play this Exocrusader you can actually definitely play Vagabot next turn. Like, there, th- this is a lot of devotion, and I will expect this card to beat uh, Phoenix every time. Just with, with the trigger. Like, you play the card, and they cannot win anymore because they need to draw cards to actually kill you. And I think they probably cannot do that. I'm not sure how much of, of this is actually realistic, but it could be... Like, I think this card goes very well with Nictus and Little of the Void together. Just because Little of the Void is good in the format. Like, it's good against Phoenix, it's good against sacrifice because they cannot combo you. So you can actually use those cards that that power Nictus in a way where all these cards, like all these cards, function like as synergy pieces where you're just putting them together and they slowly become better. And I think this one can be good enough. That's my impression. I don't know. You saw this card and I saw potential here just with uh, Nictus and how how powerful this effect can be. Yeah, this makes, that makes a lot of sense to me. Honestly, I hadn't really thought about this card in uh, that context, but I think that makes that that does make sense to me that the trigger should probably win the game against phoenix and i mean it is a very powerful card like that's a very drastic effect right so yeah i could see it um, and, and if you play this and then you have like a great merchant of asphalt or whatever i mean you're gonna kill them right like, like oh, what sorry it's just the the great merchant yeah just drain life for devotion or whatever oh like, sure six yeah. devotion is 
is a lot. Like, I don't know if it's better to play Grim Merchant or just to play more, like, big creatures or whatever, but this card, Anictus, makes it so, like, next turn you have infinite mana to do whatever you want with, you know. And you can play some mana sinks. Like, I, I thought maybe some Dread Shade or whatever was maybe playable, but probably not. Who, who knows, right? But I, I just... Nyctus, Loyal and the Void, and this demon together can do very powerful things, I feel. So, me, me and Anthony were talking about uh, a reanimator strategy that uh, you could do with the new cards, because um, in the new set, there's the uh, Ors of 4 mana card that reanimates. Uh, and also the Fateful that costs one mana, and that is the one mana one one that you pay for and you reanimate a creature. So if you have like the um, very many enablers, like Grizzly Salvage or like Cash Grab, um, obviously that's going three color, but you can have now ways to reanimate for four mana. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that's just an effect that didn't really exist, right? Yeah, go on. No, go, go, go ahead. I was, I was yeah, I mean, so the, the important thing is that I just don't think there was a playable four mana reanimation spell in Pioneer before. I mean, there was le there was legally Shieldred's Restoration, but you weren't really going to use that because you would die a bunch of the time after resolving that, basically. But I think now that there's both a more powerful reanimation target and uh, specifically a, a newish effect to Pioneer, I think that might be significant. Because before, you also didn't really have anything to reanimate that would reliably win you the game as much as Valgoloth does, I think. Like, you don't win every time Valgoloth resolves, probably, but I think you win enough of the time compared to Atraxa, where I think it was not that hard to put a turn for Atraxa into play and then lose. I think that's less true for Valdemar, uh, specifically because it has it's hard to remove. It, you can't really race it because it's bigger, and it has that leyline effect which protects you from a few things. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, maybe there's a reanimated deck in Pioneer. I don't really know what it would look like. Uh, you know, I was just spitballing cards like Grizzly Salvage, um, Maybe my old friend season Hallow Blade, you know, that that sort of thing. But uh yeah, I could see there being a new archetype. Like it's not like the ley line where it just goes into something that already exists, but maybe there's a new deck here. Well, I was gonna say like maybe Reanimator compared or even can be merged with uh Grisfang, right? Uh at yeah. the end of the day, <laughs> you also probably win most of the games where you Grisfang for Hellion. But you could you can actually reanimate the Grease Fang, right? Yeah, and good, no. whatever pieces you put to to enable the Grease Fang, you can also enable Balgavov. So maybe there's a bridge deck there where you can just be like with a savage and you can either go Grease Fang or go reanimate Balgavov. And I think that's good. You, you can get the Shield Red, I mean sorry, the, the one mana remade guy. Or you can also meal the rest of the moth and just cast it for six because you know it's not that hard. And yeah, maybe that's I mean that's probably what I would start looking. Right, like just absent reanimator, but mix it with Chris Fang, which also still keeps them in check, right? Because if you're playing a full, you know, big gun reanimator, you actually open this vulnerability where you know you become a slow, whatever. But you already have two or three kills on top of that. That that's actually like you know big deal. And also, I think Chris Fang, it's not like it's good against Ravier Hate, but it offers a bit of resistance, right? Like some of the yeah. enablers are. Rafi like sometimes playing Grisfang Fang sometimes you went like Rafinsky Foreman into Grease Fang against Rest in Peace and you will just attack for seven twice and win the game, right? And I think that's also something I will try to have. I don't know if it's possible, obviously, but there seems to be a lot of overlap there, right? Yeah, that's something I was thinking about as well. Um including, for example, the new card Cynical Owner. Like if you want to enable that card, one of the best ways to do so in Pioneer is uh Smuggler's Copter. So like maybe you can try to pair all of these cards together. I don't really know if you can fit all of this stuff, but you know, you, you maybe Mardu, you maybe Ma Mardu with Fable Harvester Copter, so you can discard either part of the combo and then just combo that way. Yeah, like that, that could be uh, right. Like that's all, all of this features. overlap. There has to be something, I think. Well, um, they overlap pretty well because you can be yeah Harvester Copter Fable. That's a lot of enablers. Maybe Bridge of Triumph. That's like you can play like sixteen discard effects or whatever, and then play the combos, and that's that's probably good enough. I don't know. Yeah, honestly, maybe Blaze Maya, but like one of the problems with Marta before was the mana. Like maybe the Black Red Line actually helps with that. Um, that's something I could see. Like I don't really like those cards in multicolor decks usually, but specifically that one might be fine for the way the Mardu decks mana works, where you're mostly just splashing red, and uh, a card that is functionally a swamp is not so bad to play in that deck. You care more about black mana than anything else, so I could see it. I'd... Yeah, I guess we. We haven't we haven't talked about the the new lands. 
those are definitely interesting card that I've added um, to Pioneer. Uh, there's five of them, and the one you mentioned is uh, Blades My Verge that adds black normally. But if you control a swamp or a mountain, it also can add red. So it's a bad land basically later in the game. But early game is a swamp. It doesn't go too well with like the various black cliff cliffs and I don't know haunted ridge or whatever dual land, um, the flip land, uh, the pathways. So whatever land isn't uh, actually doesn't have the type of a swamp. Um. But yeah, yeah. I think these are probably not that impactful in Pioneer. I think something that's true for these cards in general is that they're worse the better that your mana is because uh, I mean, the better your mana is I think the more duels you have, right? To get the lands that do things or lands that create more sources independently. Uh, so this probably gets not like, I, I think it's very hard to see playing many copies of these cards and they don't really uh, work very well the with with utility lands or with the best duels other than shocks, so yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I feel like inherently these cards are worse the higher power you draw. Um, well, so in 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 modern, I know that we're mostly talking about pioneer now, but in modern, I've tried Gloom Lake Verge uh, last week, and I thought it would it made a lot of sense because I was playing in the blue black frog tide. I had a couple of uh, dark slick shore and a couple of this. And yeah, I mean, it's only bad if you need to like fatal push on turn one, because this adds blue. But if you have a Islander Swamp, it adds black. But in modern, where your mana base is mostly just fetch land, shock land, and basic lands, I thought this was maybe better than uh, like a split with Dark Slick Shore. Because, like, of course, on turn four, this comes to play on top, Dark Slick Shore comes to play top. So they both have a downside. Yeah. It seems worse on Dark Slick Shore, right? Like, I... the fact that, like, when you cannot push your season to one, this seems worse to me. No, I don't think. Yeah, I very much think that this is probably a very severe. Like, I don't think. I I, th I, mean, I think your turn one matters way more than your turn four and one, right? Like, the faster the format as well, the worse this is at being a dual land, because it never turns on fully on turn one, uh, unless you are very. Unless you only have plays of the main color of this card. Let's, let's say, like, if you play exactly one copy of this card. And your hand has to do turn one push, and you don't have another land. That's like kind of a strange situation to find yourself in, like given like mulligan decisions, and you know what I mean. Well, it's more that uh, like, well, the fact that you you might it might force you for if for example if you have a fetch, and this card it might force you to fetch and shock in, uh, in order to push turn one, and those are the matchups where you least want to fetch and shock, right? Like that's a matchup where like this is like actually much worse than Dark Slip Shores. Uh, and I think that's probably the default for bot. Yeah, that's a definitely a good point. Yeah, you also lose surveil because now fetches are split considered cards, so it's even more costly to fetch when you don't want to fetch. I think the scars are just like too far away from power level in modern. Honestly, I mean, obviously, if you try to find for a spot where the one of these is good, maybe it exists. Like I don't know if it would be like the Balakut deck or whatever, but like. I think they're just like not playable in modern. As for Pioneer, I think what Anthony said is true. If they end being good somehow, it probably will make cards like Castle Lodgewain worse because you will have like less basic swamps to accommodate these kind of cards. But I'm not even sure. Like the mana base, for example, on Ragdos decks usually are that the mana base tends to be that good that having these over whatever lands you're playing is probably not that good compared to how good the Castle Lodge can be. But I could see that being the case, though. I could see Castle Lodge going out just to play like an even better mana base. Maybe. Yeah, there's real diminishing returns. Overall, I'm very low on this cycle, I think. I don't think they're very powerful. I don't think they're very good. And I also don't think they're very fun. So I would say this is my one of my least favorite cycles of dual lands ever. I actually think the design is fine. Like it's, I mean, I think it's it's new at least, you know. Like it's not the seventh time they play in Triumphs or whatever. Like I value the fact that they're new, but I, I mean, obviously they are not in terms of gameplay. They are not particularly challenging to play with because either they're basic or they're dual land. <laughs> yeah, but, like it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, compared to yeah, like I think cycle lands are very interesting to play with. For example, like Triumphs or whatever, but like or even the two mana, two mana tablon cycle lands, the Amonkhet ones. I yeah, actually those thought th th those ones were definitely among my favorite dual like cycle ever because they were very challenging to play with. 
mostly in every kind of deck and at any point of the game. Like often you will be like, uh, you know, I don't know what to do because in standard you often have a lot of uses for extra mana or whatever. But still, I think, you know, let's see how this play because I think... I value that they are trying new things or whatever, and maybe maybe they they end being like challenging in terms of deck building. Even though probably that's not going to be that common once we learn how these lands work. Uh, that's probably a more likely thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, guys, I want to us to talk about one card. Not exactly because the card is good, but because I think it's going to give us a great thumbnail. Okay. What do you guys think about Arabella Abandoned All? And what's your opinion on photoshopping our faces on it? Well, I want to be the one on the right. Why? What's the difference okay. between them? I mean, obviously Mangro is going to be the middle one, but like, what? what's yeah. the... I don't know. Why is the right one uh, better just... for you? I don't know. I feel like I like that one. It doesn't have air. It doesn't have air. The other one has air. No, I mean the right. Oh. That's, the, that's the left, right? Like, not um, in uh, Arabella's right, but in your right. You wanna... Oh, you want to be the one with the air? Yeah, I want to be the one with hair. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. Interesting. All right, Anthony, you're the one without air then. <laughs> okay. That's decided. Um, okay, but so I this card, I think it's good in uh, Yoshimaru in Dual Commander, by the way. What? Is it? <laughs> that sounds what very dubious. That? that doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> so I'm... it does, it's a 1-3 that deals drains life for eggs creatures you control so like the one three guy from the new next set Blumboro in black right uh yeah similar the, um well it's 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 okay you don't necessarily have something to say but we had to definitely acknowledge it if it was if he wanted to be the thumbnail <laughs> i mean is this car this car's probably not completely unplayable like this is very good with token generators like uh, we've seen worse cars than this one actually yeah i mean um, um if you curve it into like hop to it or something, I, I guess that does something. <laughs> but... Like this attack, this is a two three kind of right. It's a two three that drains life every time it attacks. Well, you can make it way better than two three. I mean, like if you like if you specifically the have the minimum. Yeah, yeah. Like the bare yeah. minimum is two three. Like this can attack for easily three, four, or five damage and draining some life. So it's definitely not like. I think this card is bad enough to joke about how bad it is. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, he was talking about playing it in commander. <laughs> so, I mean. That sounds absurd. Well, Yoshimaru. well, it's also each opponent, you know? So uh, that's, that's like a 20, 22 3 kind of. <laughs> well, wow. well, what I'm talking about dual commander now. That's a magical line format. Uh -huh. Right. So we had a challenge, which actually a person from my city won, and no other challenges fired, only that one. So oh. first and only champion. So, <laughs> well, I mean, do you guys think like that will actually end up being on the mocks or whatever? Before you say no, no. before you say no, no, remember the pauper is there. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I could probably see it. Like, why not? No like, one, I no mean, one, no one ever saw that one coming. So it's an official. I mean, that actually happened. They they do like they, they they do like serious cube drafts for the mocks, right? So like, sure, why not? Like, it's not any more absurd. That's than true, that. actually. So why not? I think I think but they. My, will. I, my, I actually think they will. My problem with dual my problem with dual commander is that it's not run by Watsi or anyone. It's just run by. I think a group of French people, you know, the various ban lists and such. But maybe in the future, yes. I mean, but, Pupa, you know, just Pupa Pupa okay. was just kitchen kitchen table game for years, and so was by Popper, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I said. Uh, that's why I said maybe the future for now. Like I'd say, you know, I'm going to play a, a dual commander tournament with a Black Lotus in first prize in in France, so I'm definitely in it. It's uh, uh... but. Uh, it, it's so surprising yeah. that anybody could have a problem with a group outside of Wizards making ban decisions. You know, I, I could see how that could go wrong oh, very badly. Oh, wow. But, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mengu, if there is, <laughs> if there is, like, if they introduce the commander to the mocks, I expect you to actually do a walkthrough for us to jump into that one. Yeah. Uh, we... all, all our listeners, where you tell guys, them, we, like, we punted. You know, guys, we punted. We should have, like, we should have like started talking about mana crypt at the beginning. We should have like thumbnailed the mana no, crypt no, thing. No, no, so that no, we would have, no, we would have no. got, no. That's, we would have got all the clicks. Yeah, no, it's so because far we are a competitive, competitive magic podcast. We yeah. speak about that's competitive true. formats. That's true. We would lose our brand. No, well, it's also <laughs> In just change of some mere clicks. Yeah, like I, I, I don't really like it when commander focused content creators, uh, provide hot takes on competitive or competitive balance issues and clearly have 
uh, absolutely no idea what they're talking about, right? Like it, that that always annoys me a little bit, and I wouldn't want to do the reverse where you know a bunch of competitive players make some grand opinion on on bands that have. But it could really have been. It about. could have been just a. It could have been just a joke, you know. We were just talking about minor crypt, about like in cube or stuff like that. It just whatever, it's fine. It's gone now. <laughs> yeah. Our faces are on Arabella abandoned doll. Yes. And um, why don't we move on and talk briefly about modern? Yes. Where uh, a super sweet deck won a challenge, and I played it on stream today, and it was very good. So I want to know your opinion about this deck. So there's actually a plethora of different Upso spells deck that now we have a reason. We kind of expected it though, like when MH3 came out, at least, uh, uh, you know, I, I was definitely like trying to see which uh, deck could go. Mostly I was doing the Oops All Spells thing with the 4 mana 2 3 self mill, but actually Char Belcher seems to be the one that's doing the best lately. There's uh, the one with Selective Memory, uh, Tasa's Oracle, and now this one that has Tameshi and um, uh, Weir of Invention with Lotus Field. Uh, with Lotus Bloom, sorry, and actually Tameshi is super good if your mana base is full on spell land because you just bounce ah. your spell lands <laughs> and then you cast them. So your lands end up being the payoff. So even if you have nothing, you just have Tameshi plus Lotus Bloom. You just get like 12 mana and then you bounce, let's say, uh, where is it? A Seeker Restoration, you draw cards, or you bounce Waterlock Teachings and you get seek a restoration and draw a lot of cards and then eventually just kill them or you bounce a uh, rush of inspiration which isn't good but you know it does something and um and so yeah it was it was a good deck today i went um i mean i went for a while losing to boros but honestly the deck just felt like it felt like a strong combo deck with all the counters we have counter spell force of negation commandeer pact of negation yeah i, I like this deck and i wanted to know what you think about this 61 cards alarm 61 cards alarm please it's, it's okay just cut just cut one card just cut one card <laughs> I, pl I, I play 60 i play 60. Uh, you <laughs> cut? So, um uh, apparently doomwick tweeted that it was a mistake list and oh. he cut two mishores bubble and added one commandeer so oh, okay um i played that back i played that version yeah i mean this i could see this deck being good uh it's some um... I mean, obviously, although you have you do have some counter spells, like your interaction being limited to that is something of an issue. But I like I kind of like the concept of the deck. I don't really know if uh, it can have legs long term because of that interaction issue. But I could see this. I don't know. Like I think I'd have to figure out how fast it is on average before I wanted to have any particular yeah, opinion yeah. on this deck. But hmm, yeah, the thing. the weird invention was fantastic for me. Just getting both like Char Belcher. Or getting Lotus Bloom to come with Tameshi, or getting the Cyborg Damping Sphere, or the the Cyber Tomo script. It was just yeah, it it was doing a lot for me, and uh, it's a card that I've played in the past in the Prism deck, and I haven't played it anymore. But uh, very impressive, because like with Pented Prism, it turns it into like a three mana card basically, because you can both remove the counter and uh, tap it for Convoke. I mean, this like looks reasonably built, definitely. Uh, I think there's some issues. I'm also surprised because interactions seem to be the weakest point of this deck. Yeah, like subtlety is not seen in this deck. This feels like a deck where if your opponent goes Lang Ragavan, you're actually somewhat happy to use go subtlety there, where usually you're unhappy, but this deck you might be actually happy because all you care about is this time. So I will expect subtlety to be good enough. Like just, I I don't see why you will not play more pitches. Like this deck is just perfect to play a lot of pitches, uh, like pitching yeah. cards or whatever. Uh, that's my first yeah. um, impression. I I do think the idea is good. The the, the spell land Tameshi, secret restoration lotus interaction is actually good. I don't think you can search for restoration with teachings though, but but you can take you can no, teachings yeah. for you can teachings for weir and weir for Belcher and kill right. So it's still yeah, yeah, yeah. it's still the same like. I think this actually has legs in that regard. I also, I am surprised that for Pact of Negation is the election here. Like, Pact of Negation by definition is a card that often becomes dead in multiples because especially game one, decks do not have that many ways of interact with you and instant speed, you have to be instant speeding this. And, you know, when they don't, then you draw two of these. It's pretty bad. Even though you have pitches, so I can see what, like, you know, what, what you play some, but I think four is probably too many as a main card. That's some something that I will also look a bit at. And this also doesn't seem like a great counterspell deck. 
like I is I still think counterspell is fine just to cast and turn two against whatever goes through the stack, but probably there yeah, there are ways. That was to... mostly what I was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I, I know, I know, but like I mean, I would be super, like this leg is playing four counter spells and four spells on the cyber, right? In a metagame where energy is the best deck, and you're playing like a bunch of peach spells, like. Well, this is just so unlikely to be correct, <laughs> for example, right? Like, like you probably need to mix the interaction a bit so you can actually cover a bit more things like with your starting hands or whatever because you, you just want to counter whatever goes through the stack. Like, if you is an error talisman with this deck, you're happy. Like, you don't need to, you know, focus all on the key cards, especially because you already have, like, Force of Negation or whatever. Or even Sing in the Stupor that you can actually just breach, you know, time with it. Like, if you play Lotus Bloom, you don't mind Sing in the Stupor, whatever they play in turn 3 because you're going to have Bloom for the kill or whatever. And I think the curve, the mana curve, should be a little bit more like you know, carefully thought in this deck. I think I think that that could be made better. But I do like the idea. I do, I do like how this is built. I'm not sure also how good preordain is uh, in this specific deck because it's often gonna cost you like three life, pretty much, which makes it a little bit less like you know appealing yeah. or whatever. But I will have to play yeah, obviously more I, with it. That's what, Go ahead. Yeah, that's why I said as well about the preordain. I. I ended up saying I didn't like it much because of exactly your reason. Like, you have to pay three life for it. Yeah, and for that reason, spells are actually good. Like, I could easily see, like, some pre-ordains becoming spells not being better, and you can keep the counter spells. Like, there's a lot of ways to build this deck, right? But pre seems not great for counter spells, maybe too much. Spells are should be good. Salty should be decent, at least. I do think the Panther Spirit makes sense, but also it's a card that could be a three off or whatever. But I'm just, I'm just need picking a bit. Like, I think this deck actually looks I good. like. You know? Yeah, I mean, I love uh, comments like yours uh, that aren't uh, that are more on point. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but I like the I like the idea. Like, there's a lot of people working on these decks. I've seen a mono white uh, a mono white Belcher deck lately with the um, the Peach card from Cold Snap. So we know Soul Spike, we know Commandeer. The white one is actually a sweeper, like a Wrath. And uh, there's like a mono white deck playing that now. So this is more and more and more um, work in that space. But uh, we gotta we gotta also uh, uh, mention the 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 the, 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 the three challenges the three challenges over sixty four players were all won by Boros. Uh, two of them being exactly the same uh, main deck with three copies of Ragavan. And the third one also having Ragavan. So Ragavan is definitely back on top of modern. Uh, all the. Um, yeah, there's. Ragavan is there. A lot of combo decks. I guess Ragavan is um, very strong again. So today I streamed with uh, uh, Mono Blue uh, Belcher and then Twiddlestorm. And I faced Ragavan a lot. And it was a problem all the time. So definitely good against combo decks. We've mentioned that a lot. Um, a card that I want to discuss you about and ask you about is Bonecrusher Giant, because one of these three Boros winners had two copies of Bonecrusher Giant in the main, which uh, main reason, of course, is uh, to blank the protection from the One Ring. And yeah, I wanted to ask if that's something that you guys would consider in your Boros deck, or you think is just too situational. Uh, yeah, I would lean towards it being too situational and I also don't think it makes for for similar reasons to what uh, I outlined last week um, based on what I feel about this deck and what Stefan had mentioned about the deck is that I don't think you can make any significant improvements past playing the maximum number of flages and I think so it seems like not very internally consistent for me to play fewer than four flage but then also play Bone Crusher Giant which is ostensibly mostly for the mirror of the one ring like maybe there are other the one ring decks where this matters but i kind of don't really think that's the point like i don't think like the bone crusher stopping the one ring is especially good against the other one ring decks either because bone crusher is so bad outside uh the one ring uh, outside being a one ring answer against the other decks that play the one ring so yeah i don't think it's good um i get i, I think playing it is Assuming a lot about the One Ring and about energy that I don't think holds true. I actually think playing like one copy of this effect is not that bad, just because like, I mean, what Anthony said, I think is true, but one thing that can easily be underrated, I think in Boros specifically, 
is how well the damage spells actually stack. Like Boros is a deck that is very good at dealing the first amount of damage. And like this deck is, for example, playing Bolt over the Fourth Discharge or whatever. Like they think damage matters. And I think it does. And I think that makes Bone Crusher Giant better. Like the more bone spells you play, the better they become. So I think even though Bone Crusher Giant is often gonna be pretty bad in terms of like the you know, mythic game matrix, if you know what I mean. Like, obviously, it's not good against Ultrasi, even if they play the one ring, right? But if you're playing game, uh, Bone Crusher Giant on game one, that makes your lightning bolt better. And I think that's probably the reason why this card is seeing, like, this card is seeing that this amount of play, because it's actually what you want to have on game one in a lot of situations where you just need to have, like, more lightning balls to kill him faster or whatever. And this also, you know, like, if you're working with that approach, actually dealing like five damage against the one ring or whatever instead of two does change the math enough to I think I think it's fine to have it because game one stacks fairly well and post cyborg you're playing against a deck where they're bad, you're gonna cyborg them away along with the bolts, right? Like you're gonna do that against like you're gonna cyborg all these cards together often and I think that's okay. I I will be inclined to try it at least, like play one or two and see how, how it feels. But it's mostly like there's, I'm sure, more small cards you want to kill across the metagame. Like, killing two mana, paying two mana to kill a Jani is good, and I'm sure against some decks, like, you know, interactive decks where you're dealing some damage and then playing a creature is not as bad as having, like, a fourth discharge, for example. Like, I think it fights with this kind of card. It's not like you're cutting, like, a Raptor to play it, right? You're cutting interaction to feed interaction that's good against Ring, and also deals damage to the face. It's player removal, as we will say. And I think on that regard... I will, for example, play the first one Crusher Giant over the fourth Galvanic Discharge. I think it will be better in the mirror, and the mirror could be the reason to play the fourth Discharge, while I'm also having a better card against non-interactive decks like Storms or whatever. Not against Storms specifically, but against Eldrassis, where I would rather have the, the Bone Crusher. Against Storm, I would obviously have Discharge, but that's a whole different story. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's okay. My impression is that it's okay. Not great, but I would probably be glad to play one list. Yeah, for this. Yeah, reasons. I think the card is a high enough power level that's plausible. Like, I think if you're using it for like the classic, like the way that Bone Crusher Giant was used in standard, you know, where you stop something, get value, and then play a four three, and then you also sometimes have the mode where the damage prevention matters, then that's good. But I wouldn't play it for the primary purpose being the damage prevention. If that makes sense. Like, I think it's much better that way as a card that lets you be a little bit bigger i don't think it's a huge deal I, I also don't think it's great but yeah i mean like when i say i don't think it's very good i also don't think it's very bad either simply because the card itself is well it's just a very good card i guess so the floor well, is well the thing is it's gonna it's gonna be consistently across the worst cards in the deck right like even any good matchup is gonna be a medium card but the thing is bone crusher some is it is a it is a very yeah it is a very good bad card because the floor on the card is dealing too damage to the opponent, where Bolt also teams with that. So I think what you say is very important. Like it's also never very bad. Well, never very bad sounds like a feeling to a card that can sometimes be a ten. Because there's some situations where the card is a perfect card, right? Yes. Like they play Ring, and then you're like one crusher. I think that's okay. Like having your bad card being sometimes a ten is definitely appealing for, especially a deck like Boros, where most of the games are just won by by the team players being like. You know, outrageously powerful, like a Johnny and Guide of Souls or whatever. Yeah, I think it's important right, to let's... identify exactly what the card does. Like, we're not playing this card because, you know, the One Ring is, like, super insane and important. Like, it's not like that, well, the One Ring is a super centralizing card. That's, that's the reason why we're playing it. Like, it's an added bonus to a card that we think is otherwise, you know, reasonable because it has these elements of the deck that make it... Uh, so it has a reasonable flaw, right? So... I think understanding that is probably important. Like, and that's, I mean, yeah, I could, I think maybe like it makes sense as a one off, like thinking about it. Um, but that, that's, yeah, I mean, I could like, be wrong, maybe, but I think yeah. having, yeah, it's also like the, the only card you can have that punishes the ring. Like, your deck is actually, you don't care that much about the ring overall because, you know, often people are going to die after, you know, yeah, you one turn or whatever. But have, yeah. having one punish is actually good and you have the silver lance to dig a bit deeper. So, yeah, let's just move on. But I think, yeah, this yeah. was a good idea. Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been liking the Bone Crusher. Um, okay, let's go to uh, Pioneer. 
very briefly, but I definitely wanted to uh, ask uh, if you guys saw the winner of uh, Saturday Challenge 64 it was uh, Chuko on uh, a old deck strategy that was revitalized by the Vayne Reaper band, Rakdos Midrange featuring the one and only Coligans Command. Have you guys seen this? Uh, I hadn't, but yay. <laughs> Uh, are you happy to see it now yeah i mean yeah so this draw. is Rakdos mid-range that you know javier and anthony have played a lot javier made the famous um guide after pro tour uh was it philadelphia so it was like what yeah over two years ago now yeah. um no, maybe two years. And anyway, yeah, the the, um, the Rakdos Midrange deck that I've played uh, in two RC and both of the times I went 3-4 with. So, bad experiences will make me not play this deck at the next RC. But other than that, some people are still winning with it. And uh, in particular, this Chuko player, he's playing with four copies of uh, Archfiend of the Dross main deck. And that is a testament to the power of uh, Phoenix? Well, it's both good against Phoenix and Sack, right? Well, is this even better than Shield against Phoenix at this point? Uh, well, I mean, it's harder to kill. Like, I, I did think it was maybe a little bit better than Shield there um, when I played it. It was close. Um, yeah, I think it might. I think it's probably a little better overall, just because it you get punished like way less hard uh, for playing Archfiend than Shield. Like, a Shield on check this on is somewhat often better. But uh, I think Archfiend dying less often and, and still winning like a fairly uh, at a fairly good clip against Phoenix is important. But um, I think against other decks as well, uh, there's there's much bigger differences there because I think Archfiend and Children are more similar against Phoenix than other decks. Like I think Archfiend's like better against Sacrifice, but then if you play against something like Lotus, like the Archfiend is actually horrible and Children is pretty good. So. Uh, yeah, there's bigger differences, I think. That's definitely more of a metagame thing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought that the Black Red deck wouldn't necessarily die with the Vampire's ban. Like, it didn't, it didn't really make sense to me that it would just be unplayable because I didn't think uh, the Vampire's thing was, like, especially key. I thought it was good, but not, like, key to the deck. So it might still be playable. I don't know how good it is, but I don't know. It's probably fine. I don't know if... I mean, that's just Black Red, isn't it? <laughs> Just yeah, I mean it's, <laughs> it's just black red. I agree. I mean it's. I mean if the archfiend is good, I can see this deck winning a lot. Also, you know, like this is gonna be different from the RCs because now decks, the tournaments are not that high level. Like yeah. pioneer challenges are often just like net deck people net decking against each other, and black red picks apart very well in decks that are not well built. That's what it does. Like the more refined decks are. And the better, you know, players get at, you know, learning deep knowledge about matchups or whatever. This is a bit worse for decks like Black Red, I think. So I will I will definitely expect this deck to, to, to you know, to be a top dog in the beginning of the format in a situation like this. But it doesn't mean it's going to be a, a good option going forward, like for DRCs or whatever. Even though this is also very hard to kill. Like, I'm pretty sure this is going to be at least a decent tier two, <laughs> right? Because... Thoughtseize pushes Fables and more Crushers and Harvesters and Trespassers and Crosses or whatever, right? So, also, Black Eclipse, please. <laughs> I mean, this whole deck is just, like, how we were just talking about Bone Crusher not being very good, but also not very bad anywhere. I mean, this whole deck is Bone Crusher. I mean, I know this deck literally has two Bone Crusher, but the whole deck is just Bone Crushers. So, like, the whole deck is just, like, I don't know. It's okay. It's it's hard to say much more about Black Red in most meta games, I think, in, in Pioneer. <laughs> Do you think Colligan's Command actually compares to One Crusher Giant? Because I actually think they're similar cards in a way. Sort of. It's better than it used to be, that's for sure. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, it plays a little bit differently, but I, I, I think I understand the comparison that you're, that you're drawing here. Um, Maybe it's the wrong one. I'm just I'm genuinely asking, like, because, I mean, they fight for the slot, right? Like, if I was trying to put more one crusher giants in this deck, which I would by the way. Uh I would probably start looking at Colligan's command to make space for one and probably I will look at the go for the throat. No, probably torch the tower. I don't know. Maybe three one crushers, but I would definitely look at the spaces to put the third copy of one crusher giant because if it's good enough for modern, it's good enough for pioneer. Kinda. Um yeah, I mean they do slightly different things. Like they're both like kind of cards in 
uh, are ostensibly they play like a very specific sort of similar role in grindy matchups um, and have like a little bit of coverage as interaction. Bone Crusher obviously being like quite a bit better there, but Command being better against some of the specific key cards and they reckon a Bankbuster and sometimes Fable, depending on how the game plays out uh, in Mirrors. But yeah, I mean they I mean they're similar in that regard, I guess. But I think Bone Crusher is generally a better card than Command. Uh, I don't know whether like having specifically the first copy is important for mirrors or something because you really care about removing bank busters, but that is yeah, true. I could see it. And well, one thing about this deck is the cyborg is still like full of you know great cards. Like, I mean, cyborg was probably the biggest rock to strength all the way at some point, right? Like, it's still like you look at the cyborg and it's like, yeah, when you cyborg cards, they're good. <laughs> like, it's not there's it's not feel you don't need to cut many things and when you put things they're just very efficient or just the game defining cards or you know not a huge fan of the seventh duress but probably good enough anyway i mean we've played that kind of effect and yeah it's been fine i mean the hate cards like go black and get it to be consumed all are just yeah there's absolutely sick i don't think any other deck other than like re- other than like rest in peace there are just no side other decks don't have cyborg cards that approach the quality of black red cyborg i believe so yeah, you know, uh, I will spec this. Yeah, Mango is now showing the white red token decks. Yeah, I wanted to yeah, I just wanna, segue into. Yeah, go ahead. And I just want to cast again. Invoke Despair against this deck again and again. <laughs> That's all I want to do. <laughs> yeah, so um, for those of you who are now watching on YouTube, uh, there is a, a deck that is popping up and actually won uh, the, uh, the last uh, Pioneer Challenge of the weekend, which was just Boros mid range with, um, yeah, just a lot of blue borrow cards. Four carrot cake, that's the two mana one one food that makes another one one and also scries one against three life, does a lot. There's care taker talent, and that's the the class that just copies tokens, gives you cards, pumps your tokens. Another card that you know wasn't really on our radar to be good in a pioneer, but most importantly, I would like to say there's four copies main deck of high noon. That's the uh, rule of law that hoses Phoenix and for five mana basically just deals five damage to anything. So yeah, this is like a, a deck that I didn't expect to be a good deck in Pioneer, but it's been doing well and even won a challenge now. Well, first of all, this is not a mid-range deck. This is very much a control deck, right? Like I want to get that out of the way first. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I do think this deck as like it's a control deck that has limited forms of interaction uh against specific things and i could see high noon compensating i think that's kind of the point that's why high noon is so important right because it's specifically very good in the matchups that you cannot otherwise interact with i don't feel that it's quite enough to do that um like i don't really think you can usually patch up a structural weakness with a single card in this way very often uh especially when it can be circumvented maybe phoenix has a little bit of a harder time with that but um, for example, like we're really, really leaning on that card to have any kind of game plan at all against Lotus, and it's not like Lotus can't beat a card like this ever. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's somewhat of a flawed control there, uh, but it's uh, <laughs> I, I I do think Pioneer seeing a lot more play in uh, Pioneer right now does make sense. Like I think that card, I don't know, I I, I thought the couple months worse than it was. I was quite surprised by how good it was. In general, in the in the control decks, more so in the blue ones, I think. But I guess it's more important here, specific because of the deck specific weaknesses. Uh, yeah, I like how this deck is built. Actually, like it's a control deck, but I I don't agree that like High Noon presents a huge problem. I, like if I'm playing Phoenix and they had turn High, High Noon on turn two, it's often gonna feel like a turn to kill. I think. And if I'm playing Lotus, obviously I do have you know tools to fight against it, but not that many main deck, and it's like. If they go high noon into Fable, well, it's not going to be that long until there's another high noon and, and they're going to stack very well with each other. And, like, well, also, I think I said the other time we talked about this deck, like two weeks ago, whatever, I refuse to believe that Caro Cake is the best to drop the puts tokens in the whole Pioneer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it still might be true, but it's like, why? Well, now there's know. even I mean, more. There must... <laughs> I, I, don't, I think but... there were only two Caro Cakes last time we looked at this deck, and now, now there are four. Yeah, like, like, this cannot be correct. I mean, maybe it is, but, but I will be very surprised if four card cake is like 
one, I will be surprised if Karo Cake is the best card. And two, if it is the best card, I will be surprised if four is correct because every time you don't have the talent, this is like completely unreasonably bad card for Pioneer. Like whatever interaction you're gonna put is probably gonna be better. Even you know, there might be something that like I, I would probably play Traveling Inspector at this point, other than like hover Infinite Karo Cake, so you can also mana curve a bit better or something. But I can that's see that. a yeah, small thing. Good with Fable as well. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, yeah, it's good with Fable and good with talent, right? But I do like how this extra structure. Like, I don't think this has as many holes because it offers, I guess, little answers to the combo with the cats and sacrifice. Like, maybe this is good. Obviously, this deck can only exist being a tier two. I mean, we use letters now, right? Tier B deck or whatever. Uh, sure, whatever. <laughs> because yeah, because if this deck is very respected, it's actually easy. Like. Control decks, as Anthony said, if they are limited on the interaction, they not only can suffer to beat some of the good decks, but also they cannot take any pressure. Like if this deck becomes the most playmaking pioneer, just having a deck that beats this deck, it's going to be easy, right? You can just build it. Yeah. And, and that's it. So this deck is going to be good on a good option for players that, you know, like this style of deck, which I actually do. But a key point is this deck cannot be very good or very common for it to be like decent it has to be like a tier two deck where it's good enough you know it's in the meta game but if your opponents are prepared against this and suddenly you know phoenix see way less play well then playing four high noon in the main deck is not very good and so goes on so i will definitely keep an eye on this deck if you're into this type of um, archetypes but definitely not something you can lock in or whatever for bombs in my opinion yeah like when you talk about Wonder. Gun, we're talking a lot about not only probabilities but risk tolerance mm -hmm. right like if if this deck is bad, like if this deck gets bad because like if something changes and it turns out this deck was not the deck you were meant to play, like it's going to be really rough for you, I think. So yep, absolutely, yeah. yeah like if they're trying to beat thing. this deck, they play lot Lotus with this enchant main deck or whatever. You're never going to win a match. This is not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's why I feel very uncomfortable. Uh, Lotus has this. Don't. Lotus has this enchant main. They they play Bozeshu and Sylvan's grind. Well, I know, so I but they they have, they have to play still... them. Like they, they I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm still happy to play. Like, I think Lotus is still very favorite against this. I, I will expect this to be bad against Lotus, but not as bad as it will look because you can sometimes draw two high noons on a fable and maybe get there. Like obviously, yeah, you have to with against Lotus. You also have like the feel of ruins that actually can Greg Lotus. Like you know, there, there's some hang. Like nice. I think this can stage. I also get lost. Like. Do not undervalue how much get lost can interact with Lotus because it does. <laughs> like it does, if you yeah. have to spend resource, if you have to kill a high noon with Wasaju, and then they play a fable, and then they have like two gets lost up. I'm telling you, finding the lethal lines with Lotus against that is not easy. <laughs> like it is not definitely not easy. Like, I I don't think this deck is that bad against Lotus, as they are built now. As it looks, obviously still behind. Don't get me wrong, but I don't think it's gonna be like a slaughter or anything. Obviously, the game sometimes you will lose because you do not interact, and that's it. But you will manage to steal quite some games, in my opinion. Speaking of Lotus, he won um, the other challenge the day before, and he was playing uh, two copies of Nine Lives, which has no combos. I remember there used to be a time where this card comboed with Solemnity, but there's no combo. Nine Lives is here just as a way to give yourself nine more lives against Mono Red uh, Burn, or rather Prowess. So, yeah, that's it's definitely another metagame uh, change that happened. Do you know which card is good against Night Lives? <laughs> Bone, Crusher, Bone Crusher no. Giant. Bone Crusher yeah. Giant. Yeah, okay. once again, the hero of the yeah. day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then I wanted to, oh. before closing, shout out another another deck that uh, did well. It's the uh, Four Color Legends straight up from um old standard with the combo of uh, Gwena Eyes of Gea plus what was the combo? Acererak. Acererak. Yeah, Acerak. Um... Yeah, that's true. Because I remember at some point this card this combo is there. Acerak plus Gwena. You also have Relic and you have the various uh, honest Ratstein combo in Rona and yeah that's that's a deck I guess. Wait, got well, second. What why yeah? is, well, how did what what made this deck reappear? Wait, does that reappear? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't know. I was, I was, I was no, this no, kind of cool, no, but I, I, yeah, I'm not sure why it's reappeared. I mean, that, there's I think it no new reason. cards. There's oh. no new cards. Is it a meta game reason? I don't know. It might just be a plot. Pioneer does this thing sometimes, but <laughs> random, random, re yeah. random reasons. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How do you guys feel about wrapping it up? Do you have anything else to say? 
I don't know something else about Bone Crusher Giant, but other than that, we good. Yeah. <laughs> I like I like that Bone yeah, Crusher Giant is the opposite sure. of the thing that we were spamming. That you know you know we made fun of Slacks for saying you might be really good, but it might be really bad. And Bone Crusher Giant is just <laughs> the opposite of that. <laughs> it can't be really good and it can't be really bad. <laughs> well, it can be good against the one ring though, and nine lives occasionally. Yeah, but sure you know, there's circle of protection, circle of protection red also. Did you ever run into that car somehow? Yeah, what? What? I don't, I don't, I'm not even sure. What no, I'm no, sure. it's it. It's not a pioneer. Come on, not yet. I mean, I'm pretty sure there's yeah. some obscure car that's actually, you know, also probably <laughs> yeah, be. yeah. All right, let's go. Thank you so much for watching or listening this episode. Uh, of course, you can support us on patreoncom carnies to join the Patreon. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next episode. Bye bye. Cheers.